Hello, I'm very excited today to have the brilliant Peter Oborn. Peter, for those who, if you don't know who he is, sort of out, but has an extremely long and illustrious career in the British media, which is very relevant uh, because we'll be talking about that. Um, and before I just say a bit more about him, uh, I think people are probably bored of me using the term moral clarity, but Peter Oborn, for me, has long epitomised that very concept, which we're in desperate need of when we're talking about the horrors, obviously, of everything that's happened since 7th of October. Um, he's associate editor of Middle East Eye, superb, must read throughout this whole conflict and also their videos. They really are an invaluable resource. Um, he's also the author of the book, Abra uh, Fate of Abraham, Why the West is Wrong About Islam. Uh, huge relevance, obviously, in terms of what we're talking about today. Um, and also so uh, learned about uh, Palestine, about about Israel, uh, spent huge amounts of time in Palestine, and last year, seven months in Jerusalem. Peter, that was a long spiel, but it was necessary because, you know, you are a very esteemed guest. Hello, how are you? I'm uh, Very well, thank lovely to meet you uh, again, Owen. Um, let's just start, I think, with, because now we've had the, the ICJ ruling last week, so we've had actually five days for Israel to comply, how would you, what would you say in terms of now, because, you know, in terms of what the ICJ ruling was and what's actually happened since, mm -hmm. what would be your evaluation? It's a fascinating case study in uh, how the Western political media class uh, covers and reacts to events in Israel stroke Palestine. And so if you look at, the ICJ uh, document and a court ruling was very, very powerful. It, it, it found that there were grounds for believing that Israel was committing genocide. And uh, didn't, it, didn't, it didn't make a final ruling on this, but he found there were grounds for believing this. And therefore, there had to be some measures taken by Israel to, uh, to avert this calamity. Um, uh, and it pointed to, as proof to the, you know, the genocidal statements made by pretty well I mean, many of the senior, most senior Israeli leaders, including the president, the prime minister, and sort of uh, and mimicked around the place that we've seen in these awful tapes from these IDF people. Um, it was absolutely a devastating document, and was this, was uh, the reaction to it? I have found. Astonishing. Let's take the example of the London Times, which um, claims to be a, a newspaper of record, Britain's perhaps leading broadsheet, etc., leading, leading newspaper. Um, the, on the Saturday, the day after the ruling, I, I looked through the Times. I found a small piece on page three of the world's, what they call the world section, page 42 of the Times itself. That was the only coverage. Uh, the following day, I looked at the Sunday Times, uh, ditto. Uh, uh, you had to go to the back of the book uh, 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 and you found a piece about South Africa being anti-Semitic. Um, and really the Times has not covered this. It does not cover the findings. Uh, and then, but what has simultaneously happened, and you'll find the same narrative everywhere, is that suddenly the UNRWA story gets unleashed. So that's the UN agency which looks after um, the, the main humanitarian agency in Gaza. Yeah, looking after the refugees. I mean, as they have been really since 1948. And um, and suddenly you get this UNRWA story uh, that there are a small number, according to uh, Israel, of, of UNRWA people who, who were involved in the atrocities committed by Hamas on the 7th of October. And that becomes the dominant story. Uh, very quickly, if you look at the media narrative and also the political narrative. And so let's take the uh, example of the British government, but you could be looking at Europe, we can be looking um, above all the United States. So having the reaction of the British government, first of all, is by from David Cameron, the Foreign Secretary, and from Rishi Sunak, is to reject the ICJ. This is one of the most senior courts in the world. They don't simply reject its findings. They say they don't agree with it. 
Um, and uh, they say it's furthermore, it's not helpful. This is, this is Cameron's language. Sunak, according to the Daily Telegraph the following day, which actually said that it was um, a sort of dark irony that, he, that, 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 they, that this court should level these terrible accusations against uh, Israel. And so it, 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 it stands firmly with the Israeli government. This is the position of the British government against the International Court of Justice um, at the same time as picking up instantly on the UNRWA uh, allegations which we've seen which we saw come out of Israel um, there was they immediately closed funding they said how shocking these allegations were and that becomes the story not the ICJ ruling we're talking about the Western media here and the Western politicians it becomes the UNRWA allegations. And then by the way, they, they are only allegations. Um, I'm not saying, I have no idea if they're true or not, but all they are is allegations. Uh, and immediately the Act West responds by slashing, ending funding for the le leading humanitarian agency in, 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 in Gaza. At the same time, it's not reacting at all, but trashing the, the findings of the court uh, in the context, by the way, of, I don't know, 30,000 plus, plus people having been uh, killed uh, in um, by Israeli action in Israel, in Gaza over the last few weeks, last two, three months. I mean, it strikes, it's, it strikes me as a kind of, kind of contagion. Um, Israeli far-right politics, long portraying the United Nations, etc., is basically part of a global terror network. Um you know, Donald Trump for a long time was portrayed as a threat to the liberal world order as such, as it was described. But you have now, you know, after the UN, after the top court on earth, uh, the UN top court, uh, the United Nations top court puts Israel in the dock. Immediately then um, Israel manages to put the United Nations in the dock, but with the direct complicity of Western governments who are then based on 0.04% of staff of UNRWA being accused of taking part in atrocities or unspecified crimes. We don't know what involvement at all. The US hasn't apparently even seen the evidence, they said. Um, but it is, it's almost like the Israeli far right has these narratives about the United Nations, etc. Now they're just, it's, it's spreading. It's, it's been adopted by Western official policy. It's, uh, you've, it's very hard to explain, but if you look at it in a, in a big way, I look back to the 1930s and the rise of the uh, of the dictatorships, and that what we were taught at school was that the the Western de democracies were just were you know were challenged and destroyed by the dictatorships. What we're seeing now, the threat to Western democracy comes from Western democratic liberal states themselves. We're having a uh, the, the the, the global order, the threats of the global order very largely comes from the United States, of course, uh, Britain and, and, and its allies in their denial, that lethal attack on the institutions which were set up after 1945 to make, to, to, to make sure never again. So the, the attacks are on, uh, you know, on the United Nations all the time. Gutierrez has been targeted, who I think has emerged Mm. wonderfully well from this uh, crisis. The, the Secretary General of the United Nations. Yeah. The Secretary General, Antonio Gutierrez, the former Prime Minister of Portugal, has, has emerged as the most improbable leader of the, of the world, of the, uh, of the, certainly of the, what the people call the global south, at this time of massive global crisis which somehow is centered in Gaza, but it extends all over, all over the rest of the world as well, as the spokesman for the poor, the oppressed, and also above all, as the spokesman for the rule of law and the global world order. And suddenly we have emerging in this context, rogue states. Now we've been taught to think of rogue states as sort of uh, Saddam Hussein's Iraq or, Iran, Gaddafi's Libya, but the red states today in this situation, the ones 
waging war on the rule of law and the institutions which were set up after 1945 to, is the United States of America, point one, under Joe Biden, uh, Rishi Sunak's uh, uh, Britain, mm. uh, 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 most of Europe, most of Europe with certain not rather noble exceptions. Uh, and this is quite terrifying for the, and frightening that we ourselves have turned on, refusing to acknowledge the rule of law. Of course, you can look back at the history of this. You can look back at the repeated ways in which Britain, uh, you know, think about the Rwanda business. We have decided, we have, we, we have generated a collection of leaders who despise the rule of law particularly international law, it's what they call foreign courts, etc. Uh, and the same in the United States, which has become insular and uh, got a horrible far-right narrative has evolved in the United States. And that is, I think, and so it is, it is set up to attack the United Nations, which is by no means perfect. I'm sorry, we're not saying that, but it's our best hope of a decent future international global future one of the many reasons i wanted to talk to you is to, to be blunt i feel like i'm going mad this is therapy partly no it's the the, the media I, look, i've worked in the british media for a much shorter period of time than yourself 12 years now as a, as a columnist and you've been a reporter and as well as a a commentator so you've done and, and you've worked in tv you've done a whole range of um roles very senior roles in the british media um, I didn't have any illusions in the British media, in the Western media, um, in terms of racism, in terms of, I don't know, unquestioning kind of official Western foreign policy, that kind of thing. I have to say, it has been not surprising, but a profoundly shocking experience, just in terms of the sheer level of dehumanisation of Palestinians, yeah. Yeah. just in terms of the way that blatant, unapologetic atrocities... Um, are normalised, are ignored, um, even apologised for by people who call themselves respectable, moderate, all that kind of thing. And even how, for example, the relentless, whatever people think about whether it's genocide or not, it is objectively genocidal rhetoric, and the ICJ ruling noted examples, that hasn't even framed the coverage. Most of that hasn't been mentioned. So people occasionally go, oh, the IDF is discipline breaking down without noting Yov Gallant, the Defence Minister of Israel, a few days after 7th of October, saying he'd released all restrictions on Israeli soldiers, which I think probably has something to do with it. What do you think about it? You've worked in the media all this time. That, what, what, what's your general sense of how this is being framed and reported? Quite amazing that... Um, uh, as you say, there's an listed in the ICJ document many of the um, genocidal remarks by by members of the Israeli cabinet, um, and not once has any British politician raised any problems with that. There's been no complaints, no rebukes, not from Sunak, not from Cameron, not from Starmer, etc. They not one of them have ever raised it. And same with the media. You have to understand in Britain, the media and politics have largely merged, particularly when it comes to issues like uh, this Gaza tragedy. And so no, no British, not once did a British uh, media person who has access to Sunak or Cameron put these genocidal comments made by Israeli politicians and, uh, and soldiers, etc., at the British British politicians to say, "What do you think? How do you react?" And until Michelle Hussein, to her great credit, did it on the Today program a couple of weeks ago when she was interviewing Grant Shapps, and he claimed not to know about it. <laughs> well, Ridiculous. he is, after all, the man who is involved in making, you know, defense cooperation with Israel. And he was, he claimed not to know about what the, this, this disgusting discourse has emerged at the top level of the Israeli, Israeli state. So that's the first thing. And it means that the British media is collaborating in what appears, in what the International Court of Justice deems to be um, a potential genocide.
And yeah. yeah. No, no, go on, sorry, go on. So I think just that on. Yeah, and that's the that's the first thing that there is a failure of journalism at a very uh, deep level. And you saw it again. Uh, when it's a minor example on the Lerner Kunzberg show uh, on the Saturday morning after the ICJ verdict, just two days, she had a cabinet minister on and she had a shadow cabinet minister on. She just didn't raise the subject for her. The ICJ ruling wasn't there. I didn't ask anybody about it. And so it's, it's, it's sort of swept under the carpet. Within 48 hours, it wasn't a story at all. And for many papers, including the Times, it wasn't a story when it happened. You've got to remember that, you know, when it, when the South African complaint took place and there was two days of court hearings, I mean, the BBC <laughs> it didn't cover the South African case. It didn't give a live stream of that, but it did give a live stream of the Israeli answer. It's, there is a, and I believe, I'm told that Sky TV uh, did the same thing as well. So there is a structural bias of almost of epic proportions, and you've got to, say that it's racist if you you know what what's happened in um in uh, in ukraine supposing that the russians have killed i mean look the figures are extraordinary i mean it's it, it's they, they've done what the is the israeli assault on gaza has cre created more damage than the horrendous damage done to aleppo in sort of four years they've done more damage as a, in three months, far twice as much as Mariupol, but in three yes. months, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, and this is not and in the denunciations, correctly so, of Assad, of Putin, mm -hmm. for, for for that those atrocities, but nothing. I mean, again, from the uh, British media, in fact, a defence, and the same applies to our woeful, hopeless. Um, morally bankrupt political class. I mean, but before I ask you about that, I mean, just on the media, you know, it strikes me that the way this is framed still is either this is basically Israel defending itself against Hamas with a side debate about whether it, it's proportionate or not, um, which we can agree to disagree on, kind of that's the approach without looking at the just colossal war crimes being committed. Clearly, they're not looking at, you know, they wouldn't look at other such onslaughts which are less devastating as is this proportionate or not but the other thing is you're i mean I, I, on twitter you can sort of lists which i've done of political journalists in the uk and i basically put all of them in and on the day of, of the icj ruling on the day of south africa giving the um, evidence not a single journalist spoke tweeted a single thing is that right Nothing. No, I went through the whole thing. Uh, lucky me, I had to. When I go through the, that list of tweets, um, uh, I have to mentally prepare myself. Off. Just often trivial, lots of trivial stuff about soap opera politics, but nothing about whether or not the British government is complicit in an alleged genocide, which I would argue is of some political importance. I mean, yeah, I mean the game I was very struck by the BBC News at ten, which I watched on Friday evening. The top item on the BBC News was the latest the kind of latest of the thing in the Trump soap opera, a court case involving Trump. And not only important, but astonishing that it should have been chosen to lead the news above the second item, which was the ICJ. And then it was a bit, once again, it was a very, on the one hand, on the other hand, uh, presentation. And above all, what it I couldn't understand this coming from what claims to be a serious news organization, the BBC, with uh, I would have thought an interest in British politics. But the consequences for British politicians. So you had in advance of the ICJ, Sunak uh, and Cameron trashing it, trashing the judgment, saying it was a bad thing to be happening and it shouldn't be happening and there was no case. And Blinken has said it was meritless, the, the South African case. And suddenly you've got the ICJ, which is hugely respected, well, one of the most respectable British lawyers on, on, on it. And um, and I thought I was waiting for them to say, what, what did this create a problem for, for the British government? Or what's the reaction of Downing Street? They didn't. They ignored that issue. And you've got to think there's a structural issue in reporting at the BBC here. Um, I, 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 actually, it was quite quite amazing the what, what the way in which 
the British media and journalists generally have failed to understand or grasp uh, what is uh, what is going on. And, and, and your list of people who didn't react to regularly provide their opinions um, on this, that and the other. No, silence is a form of complicity. And can we make another comparison? Why we have all of these, the media class is very powerful in Britain. They're hugely respected figures. They get paid astronomic sums of money in many cases. Nation, national figures, greatly admired, profiled, and they're silent on this. Now, let's compare them to the journalists operating today in Gaza. I mean, I find myself quite close to tears just thinking about what they're doing. So, I mean, according to the Committee to Protect Journalists, more than 70, I think it's 78 when I first looked, but it's more happened, have been killed. And, um, they had killed reporting uh, one of the, a, a slaughter and atrocities. Their families appear to be target. Israel denies this, but their families appear to be targeted. They appear, Israel denies this, to be targeted. But lots of, I mean, the number, I think it was 67 killed in the whole of the Vietnam War, I read somewhere. Mm -hmm. Seven, more than 70 here killed in Gaza. Now, basically, the British media ignores that. I mean, in two love, A, you've got to compare the sort of insouciant obsession with trivia in the British media from our great media journalists. Mm -hmm. Like it's a soap opera. Secondly, the way they ignore the plight of our colleagues who are being killed in great numbers in Gaza. And so it's not simply that, we, that, that so the BBC has completely failed to compare the Telegraph, the Times, the Mail, which didn't cover it at all, by the way, the story the day after, but gave a great leader page denunciation of the ICJ, called, called it a show trial. And it, it's very interesting. It wasn't just the Mail that called it a show trial. So did the Economist. So you have the great weighty Economist, all, that, all those boffins in that grand office in, you know, I think it's still in Mayfair or somewhere like that. And the Daily Mail, these kind of faux intellectuals that the economists call it the show trial, so do the, you know, the, the mm. demotic Daily Mail. There's a sort of collective view across the Daily Mail, across the British media, this is the show trial. Let's give some, there have been some decent exceptions. Financial Times, I thought it gave it a yeah. serious coverage. Yeah? And so let's say, let's hold up, there have been, not, it's not universal, but it's pretty well universal failure. And when... Historians are going to judge this. There's something sick about the British media political class at the moment. Um, I mean, before I ask you about the, the political establishment, I mean, what do you think about the idea that actually this is, Western media coverage is actually lethal. It has lethal consequences, it's coverage, <laughs> in that the ICJ ruling should have been accurately described as a devastating judgment for Israel. Devastating. Yes, they wanted cool. the case to be dismissed as somehow spurious. I, the ICJ, its judges near unanimously considered South Africa to have a plausible case which needed to be properly interrogated. And in the explanation for why they went through the genocidal quotes of the Israeli government and the absolutely catastrophic facts about the humanitarian situation facing what they described as the protected people. They had protected people's status, the Palestinians of Gaza. Um, the Western media did not portray it in that way at all. It wasn't Israel has been placed on trial for genocide. It was no ceasefire imposed, victory for Israel, blah, blah, blah. And then actually let's go and talk about UNRWA, the main humanitarian agency, and this scandal involving 0.04% allegedly of its employees. That has allowed, I mean, Israel since, uh, you've had uh, obviously the main humanitarian agency be throttled, You've had these protests against humanitarian aid being um, coming in, which is blocking humanitarian aid for one of the passings. The protesters, nothing. The Israeli army doing nothing to stop them from behaving like that. Uh, you've had an increase in, in civilian deaths. Uh, you've got the uh, Israeli army in the West Bank trying to expand the conflict by committing war crimes, by dressing up as medical staff in order to go to a hospital and kill people. 
Uh, I mean, you know, Israeli soldiers posting ever more genocidal stuff on on on, on social media. There is no evidence whatsoever that the that the Israel is is even pay, paying attention. It seems like they've done the opposite. But I think the Western media has something to do with that because they took the heat off Israel. Uh, hugely so. They um, just went along with a an alternative uh, story. I mean, they, they could have been headlines every day. Maybe that should have been that Israel defies the ICJ and, and, and slaughters another 200 Palestinians He's here, here, here and here. You know, then they would go to, you know, you, they, should, they, should, they would have put pressure on Biden, Sunak, etc., to come out with statements. Uh, and, and it would have raised, you know, condemning the Israeli, the fresh wave of Israeli atrocities after that Israel has been put on trial for genocide, but that isn't what happened. It's something it, it, instead that the narrative has moved away. It's been virtual radio silence in most of the major media about the findings of the ICJ, where there hasn't been, in so far as there hasn't been silence, there's been, it's been mis misrepre misrepresented, uh, and then a new story has been created, which people have fixed, the media has fixated on about UNRWA. That has lifted the pressure of the politicians, particularly of Benjamin Netanyahu, as he as he's allowed a new wave of attacks and slaughter in Gaza. And of course, that means that the British and American media, by the way, we used to think highly of the British media. Do you remember the days when we thought that they were sort of really tough, sort of realistic, honest people? And... Um, Instead of which, and so of course, the media is deeply complicit in all of this. It is giving the green light for fresh murder and slaughter and war crimes and atrocities. I'm not going to use the word genocide because that's not been ruled upon. That will be litigated in due course. But it, but we can talk about atrocities. Hmm. And an alleged genocide, I suppose. I mean, that's yeah. that's how the ICJ is. You can now officially call it that. Um, just in terms of the political establishment, the other thing I wanted to talk to you about, um, in terms of the Conservative government, obviously they're in power. Um, Britain has something to do with the current mess historically, to put it mildly. Uh, but the the Conservative government, for you know, under Rishi Sunak, long time and critically embracing and supporting Israel um, in terms of the horror unleashed against Gaza. I mean, do you detect a, a change in approach under? Lord David Cameron, who's now Foreign Secretary, is that meaningful? And what's your overall take about the Conservative government's approach? Yeah, I think David Cameron, up to a point, is better than his predecessor. I welcomed his appointment because cleverly wasn't up to the, the job. And he, there was an episode which I wrote about at the time last August and cleverly went to but it's very telling. He went to the West Bank on a trip to Israel through Palestine. And he asked to see, go to a one of these villages which have been obliterated by settlers. Ein Samia, not far from Ramallah, I think. And uh, he wanted, and he was told he couldn't. The Israeli authorities told him he couldn't go. And I learned this. Well, it wasn't publicized. I learned this from sources inside Palestine. I rang up, I checked it out, it was true. I, uh, but the point is this that Cleverly had asked to go and asked to go and see the site of, um, of, of ethnic cleansing, i.e., the erasure of a village by settlers, and they'd forced out the people who lived in the village. And we hadn't let him, and instead of making a fuss about it, going public. I've not been like, why, why hasn't Israel letting me go to see Ein Samia? Cleverly just kept his mouth shut. Now that, and, and it wasn't just him, two other, the foreign minister of Ireland, and I think it was Norway did the same, and they also kept their mouth shut. But it, you see, this is how, they knew it was going on, but when Israel wouldn't let them go there and say to the world, I'm at the site of ethnic cleansing, they just, were silent. So oh, Cleverly was no good. There's an incredible, I was interviewed, I think, on uh, Channel 4 News shortly after October the 7th, and he, and he got, 
he didn't he, he was struggling for words and suddenly the Israeli foreign minister took over and answered for him I mean it was as bad as that I'm so you're, you're, you're saying cleverly by name but not not by nature well I'm not, I'm not going to make any flip comments I just like Sorry. to see a uh, British foreign secretary was standing up for British what I regard as British values and among British values are hostility in not refusal to tolerance war crimes and so when cleverly uh, was moved uh, I was, I was, and Cameron came in. I thought, yeah, this is my, there is a potential for this being a better thing. And he did change the language. Um, I think cleverly had allowed Downing Street just to, to frame the whole, I think in the language of the diplomatic call, Cameron took back the file from Downing Street on, on, on Gaza and he changed the language. He started to talk about, which hadn't happened until Cameron civilian atrocities against civilians. Uh, but um, unfortunately, and it was quite, I was, and it was like Cameron's last chance. He's not going to get another label will come in and he'll go back to making money in the private sector. He, I thought he had a, nine months to, when really he was unsackable. He could, but then of course, his reaction to the ICJ was, was appalling. Um, and uh, he uh, he just trashed the trashed the result. He said it was um, he, he, he was a, it's amazing the way not just Cameron. It's a sort of syndrome of Western politicians that when they're asked about atrocities in Ukraine, they are immediately able to talk uh, with great authority about atrocities, you know, the appalling atrocities we condemn. When the, when Israel com commits atrocities, on the other hand, oh, I'm not a lawyer. You know, we, I can't can't say this is one of and, and Cameron went into this um, and he and then, of course, he went in. He suspended British funds to UNRWA oh. now on the basis of allegations, uh, whereas you, you had a very strong legal judgment from the ICJ, uh, which much stronger than what you got from these allegations which came out from Israel, which has a record of making false, I mean, I'm not saying this, these allegations were false or right, but, yeah, uh, and, and they were taken seriously, acted upon at once, uh, and uh, as for the one humanitarian operation which offers hope to the people in Gaza, we, 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 we stopped the funding. Uh, and, it, and so Cameron's response to that was absolutely an abomination. Uh. He has since made a pathetic little speech about, uh, you know, possibly recognizing the Palestinian state, which his client journalists in the in the sort of uh, you know, Tory press have written up as of somehow significant. And it does mean a, a slight move move forward, but not much. I mean, Britain's always said that in certain circumstances we'd recognise we support a two state solution. So it's not, it's not this great move which you right. you've been reading about in the last few days, the last couple of days. And it's not it's not like he he doesn't know the reality. I mean, many many years ago he described Gaza quite correctly as a prison camp. Yes, and yet, the history of this that yeah. when he was um, and it's worth noting, I. Uh, I reported this story, a story that I'm going to tell you, 12, 14 years ago. Never followed up by anyone at all. Uh, in 2006, when Israel invaded South Lebanon, the appalling as the atrocities were committed, and actually the British shadow foreign secretary at the time, William Haig, uh, condemned uh, Israeli action as disproportionate. Cameron then um, received a visitation from the Conservative Friends of Israel, and he gave them a promise he would never, would, the Conservatives would not use the term disproportionate again. Wow. Now, and then, but then to his credit, and I know why it happened actually, he, he did say that, that Gaza was an open air prison camp. In 2010, I think he said this was on because of Chris Patton, who had been, who was one of his mentors um, as a young rising conservative, and he got a briefing from Chris Patton, who was then chair of MAP, the Medical Aid for Palestine, a fantastic organisation. Uh, and Cameron had been seized on that, and he made this remark, but it didn't stay with him because in 2014 he was more or less with the Israelis uh, in that 
con- which led Saila Bastid, one, one of the most. Yeah. And because she. Uh, cause she- yeah. Well, she suggested, didn't she, that Michael Gove, um, uh, for those who, who maybe foreign audiences, uh, is a senior conservative politician, had an impact on shifting David Cameron, for example, in terms of Islam. Saeed Avasi thinks she, he pushed him. Into There's a chapter about Saeed Avasi versus Michael Gove for the heart of David Cameron in my book, Fate of Abraham. Which everyone he must is, buy, by the way. Well, I mean, but I did look, I, I was... At that time, I was the chief political correspondent of the Daily Telegraph, and I and I watched this battle for for the soul of Cameron. It was very, but to begin with, that Cameron was quite a liberal-minded leader. You may forget, remember, and he encouraged Saeed of Asi to oh. go out and uh, and embrace the Muslim concerns. And, and I and in my, I have a chapter describing how Gove intervened really in this, and that and Cameron became uh, uh, moved away, f- and Varsi eventually had to resign. Uh, it's very interesting passage of British politics because he, you, the um, uh, and well, not not record, and I'm quite proud that I took the trouble to note what was going on, and we now have it on the record the way that. Saida Vasi was effectively driven out of the Conservative Party. She remains a Conservative, but she was marginalised and not and ceased to have a voice. Whereas Michael Gove remains, of course, very much um, on the premises. And for those who don't know, Baroness Saida Vasi is the most senior female Conservative Muslim politician, or most senior Muslim politician, probably, and she's been completely isolated. I think she's the first first Muslim. Uh, female ca- cabinet minister Britain had mm-hmm. extraordinarily articulate. I think you she is, would urge you to have, you have her on this show if you. Oh, I've, yeah, I've, I've interviewed her a, a few times. In fact, I, in fact, I interviewed about Michael Gove and um, got <laughs> that became a news line at the time. And just, I want to talk to you finally about Keir Starmer and um, Labour because David Lammy last week tweeted saying that throughout the, uh, in response to the ICJ ruling, which, he, I mean, you could say at least they said that uh, uh, the Israel should abide by its ruling. But he said um, that throughout this, Labour has been clear um, about upholding international law. And that, it just isn't true. Keir Starmer at the beginning suggested Israel had the right to cut off water and energy. He is a lawyer, a human rights lawyer by trade. He does understand the Geneva Convention. I know what Article 33 says in collective punishment, so I presume he does. He also led a case uh, prosecuting uh, Serbia on behalf of uh, um, Croatia, in which he understood sieges to be illegal. Um, In fact, that was the plank of his entire prosecution at the time. Um, But also uh, throughout, you know, into Emily Thornbury, um, Lisa Nandy, David Lammy himself refused to condemn things like forcible um, displacement, cutting off energy water. And also this whole line about we've been clear international law must be upheld. What they do is they're asked about war crimes and all they say is, we think international law must be upheld. But that's a meaningless platitude, isn't it? If you're not prepared to say when international law is actually being transgressed, you're not criticising a party for transgressing it, then you're just coming up with an abstraction which has no relation to actual reality. So what do you think about Labour as a whole response, basically? Thank you very much for that analysis, actually. You put it extremely well. It's a very interesting thing, which we've had, not not just from uh, Labour and the Conservatives, but you get it from that rather weird White House spokesman, too. We're insisting that international law must be obeyed at all times, well, in front of your eyes. There's a sort of (laughs) devastating mixture of slaughter, use of phosphorus, Kind of killing in cold blood, you know. I mean, and go, and this is, but they've always insisted that it's like there's a crime screed going on, and you've got to keep the, um, and you're saying that law and order must be observed, and you're doing that. Exactly. Also, you're watching yeah. some, some guy on a, on a serial killer on the rampage. This is murder. We're clear the law must be upheld. I'm afraid that Starmer's a tragedy. I mean, his, um, his support for collective punishment on, Pretty well, day one was one of the darkest moments. He's leader of the Labour Party. I mean, coming from any West, actually, like, coming from any politician who clear, claims to support, have any idea of what human British values are, global values are, 
to support collective punishment, as Starmer did, and then to lie about it afterwards. Um, and then, as you, and then the next thing he did, he goes wanders off to um, North. I think it was um, the Jewish Labour Movement event about two weeks ago, and suddenly he says, oh, "We're not going to back us as uh, Palestinian state." Without Israel say so. He abandons Labour's. He he goes public. This has actually happened quietly. I, I understand at the Labour conference last year, but he he spoke about it. I think publicly for the first time at the Jewish Labour movement. Um, now, wh why? I mean, if you think about the issue of the Palestinian state, if you, when uh, and then he fret, he said, "I'm abandoning Corbynite policies." That was how it's. Well, actually, it was Ed Miliband who, who introduced the policy. And I, I think that's a dishonest thing. Everything is put hand... It's Ed Miliband who back the, thrown the Labour Party behind a Palestinian state. And, and it was Starmer who's, who's removed the, the policy of supporting a Palestinian state. Now, it's a very odd timing. I mean, 14 years, eight years ago, there was at least some sort... Of, John Kerry had some sort of peace process uh, going in 2014. Today we have an Israeli government which is absolutely clear it doesn't want a peace process. It's had no interest in a two-state solution, and let alone a Palestinian state. And that is the moment when Keir Starmer gets rid of a Palestinian state. Now the other thing though I would say to him is, that, say, say, why go into the Jewish labour movement, which is a partisan organisation? If you're going to make policy on a Palestinian state, you should do it somewhere like Chatham House. And after he made those remarks, I, I checked. He hadn't bought, you know, he's making policy on Palestine, not Israel, by the way. Had he consulted the Palestinian mission in London? No. And so he just goes to a partisan mm. pro-Israel movement, makes that announcement. Yeah. Well, he's not interested in going to, he doesn't, doesn't even bother to inform the Palestinian, Palestinians that he's doing this. Now, this is... This goes back to your point where we started, that Palestinians don't exist in the mind of British politicians and media. It's, the, it's a form of dehumanisation. They're just excluded from the political process and their, their future is going to made for, made, be made for them by Britain, America and pro-Israel lobbies in London, which, are, which, are, which get the kind of briefing from the, uh, from the Labour Party, but not the Palestinians. I find this... We need to find a new kind of um, discourse. I mean, we need to find a new way of doing business, haven't we? In my view, actually, watching the events of the last uh, tragic, terrible events you know, of the last three months, but also actually going back a long way, uh, the sooner that America, America and Britain have lost all legitimacy in having any engagement with uh, with the Middle East, not just with, by the way, in Palestine, but you can look at the wider Middle East, our support of dictatorships, of despotisms, our sort of involvement in illegal wars, illegal invasions, going back to Iraq. It's, I mean, we have a terrible record, and I'm afraid that the last um, few uh, months have just reinforced that. I'm um, just very finally. How do you think this all pans out? I mean. In <laughs> I guess in the long view, you know, I find it fascinating watching the kind of um, very right wing, uh, the West is in decline types who embrace this sort of onslaught because, I mean, they never seem to learn anything. Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya all accelerated the decline of the West. This is, I mean, it's a catastrophe for, I mean, I don't think the West moral authority was particularly strong in much of the world uh, to begin with. Um, but I mean, it's just it's, it lies dead, rotting in the in in the in the rubble of Gaza now, and you know, and 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 and. But also, if you look now at the US, younger generations in particular, and the more more pro Palestinian ever, and they're they're watching on social media, um, unbelievable horrors, and it's having a big impact. So, what do you think? I mean, how does this all pan out? Do you think this is hubris meets his nemesis for Israel, or 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 will they just wipe out Gaza and 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 you know? get away with mass murder I, oh, I I'm not Nostradamus hmm. I think you can just make certain statements it's, it's quite clear what Israel wants it wants Palestinians out of Gaza and I think one of the mistakes one of the, ma the major mistakes which most western commentators and politicians have made is not to listen to what the Israelis say they're completely clear about it 
and what they do. You know, if you eliminate, is it 60% of habitable buildings in Gaza? You're, you're just trying to get them rid of them. That is the, and there's all the negotiations with the attempted negotiations with Egypt or minister, Israeli minister saying that Britain will take some or they'll go to Africa. Let's, so let's just be naive, not be naive about it. That's what they are seeking to do. And the other thing which people, I think, don't, quite wake up to is that it, no, that's an hour, if you look at the polls it's got the support of the mass of the israeli people i mean this war is popular yeah it's waged really. by israel we have our america which is determined to support israel come what may um and we have the and it's a very uh, and britain which insofar as we have a policy is whatever america does it's pathetic and can I just make a point on behalf of Mrs. Thatcher, the late Mrs. Thatcher, who yeah, I know that you were very fond of in particular. Extremely, uh, very close uh, to her. You know, in, in, in 1982, Israel went into South Lebanon, was party to the slaughter in Sabra Shatila and a lot of uh, uh, refu Palestinian refugee camps. It, it, she called it pure barbarism. Why and and what Israel was and 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 I think I'm right in saying that Jimmy that Reagan Reagan rang up by rang up Begin and told him to call off the troops and he did that afternoon. The prime minister did all the time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there was a um, sense of morality in the West, uh, you know, that we don't condone mass slaughter, and this was Reagan and Thatcher. And uh, what's happened since that whatever Israel does under the most right wing leader it's ever had with a government which contains fascists. And yet we, we, we don't have a problem. We can't have any problem at all. And you, I, I'm certain that Reagan and Maggie Thatcher would have reacted in an entirely different way to yeah. Biden and, and Sunak and Starmer. And why Starmer? The leader of the Labour Party goes along. In fact, he get, keeps on getting outflanked to the left by the yeah. Tories. I mean, it's quite extraordinary. What uh, and somehow, and what the rest of the world sees is that our claims to represent human rights, decency, morality, rules-based world order, all of these conceits of the West, which are always bogus in many ways, have been completely destroyed. They're utterly worthless. But despite, we, and I, it, it breaks my heart. I mean, it's, what is Britain about? What do we stand for? Slaughtering people, Palestinians in Gaza. Is that what we're all about, is it? Well, I think a profound lesson has been taught to much of the world. And I think <laughs> there's a certain naivety that about how the West of the world sees the West because they're watching all of this. And I think they've learned a lesson which is going to have very profound consequences for generations to come. I think everyone can see why I wanted to speak to Peter and I've taken far too much of his time. So I'm very proud, uh, very proud, very, very honoured to, to have been joined by you. But and the least people can do is to buy his brilliant book, uh, Fate of Abraham. Um, I think that I think that that that's just giving something back, given given we've been um, in receipt of your profound wisdom and your experience. Uh, so do share this video or podcast, depending how you're watching or listening to this. Uh, press like, subscribe, but most of all, Peter, thank you so so much. Thank you very much. Yeah.